Hello and welcome to Fresh Perspectives. My name is Gail and my guest today is our good friend Bill Kulik, who comes on fairly often. Um, and we're going to talk today about the dangers of eating and drinking toxic foods and beverages. And we are also uh, going to talk about foods that heal. We'll, we'll, exactly. just, we'll just let you give you as much information <laughs> as we can uh, in the one hour program. I was just looking at my hair on the um, <laughs> Looks good. thing, does it? I just got I, a haircut. I can't do anything with mine. I, I, <laughs> I just got a haircut yesterday. So, um, Bill, thank you for appearing on Fresh Perspectives sure. today. Yes. You know, I kind of got the idea from this episode because the last episode that you were on, you were giving uh, your, your friend Jim uh, a massage, right. uh, was what the episode was about. Right. But the topic of some of the people who've come to you right. uh, for massages uh, sort of came up during that episode. And we somehow we were talking while you were giving him the massage about, um, <laughs> about soda pop mm, came right, up. Right. And we were, so we got to talking about the dangers of um, uh, artificial sweeteners. Although uh, I do believe that sugar is something we shouldn't have too much of. Right. And I, I somewhere read, uh, as I was doing a little research for this, that they said that um, literally one or two cans of soda a day can actually put you into diabetes. And wow. I, I know one of my clients, he, he was, he's short, he's really stocky, and I don't know if he's 5'5", five, five, and I know when he started out, he was like 228 or 224 that he, pounds. A person that short weighed that much. Right, and, but he'd been struggling with his weight for a while, and one day he came to my office, and I was like, Rich, I said, you look good. And he said, yeah, I, said, I lost 18 pounds. I said, how'd you do it? He said, quit drinking soda. He mm -hmm. said he would drink five or six cans of soda a day. Mm -hmm. And I was like, boy, that's, wow, that's five a or lot six. of sugar. That is I mean, there's lot. literally like a quarter of a cup per can. So, I mean, if you drink six cans, that's a cup and a half, a cup and a half of sugar a day oh, wow. uh, every day. Oh, wow. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, from all the stuff we've talked about before and what I've read, too, with, with sugar, I mean, uh, it's, I mean, it, it causes, it, it will, it feeds cancer, it feeds tumors. So, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, even something as simple as sugar can be a, a, a toxin. And I, I think really, you know, anything that we use too much of can be toxic. I mean, our, our thoughts can be uh, toxic mm -hmm. and, and cause uh, problems. And that was uh, one part of this uh, um, 28 day cleanse. Uh, they were talking about our, our uh, liver and our kidneys. And, uh, and it was kind of interesting because, you know, we always, we hear, we hear this, this, the phrase pissed off. And yeah, that's one I, of the I things know. about, they say about the kidney is if your kidneys are plugged up or they're not, you know, functioning properly, that you might have that where you're angry at, at everything. And uh, I honestly had, had this, this client and he's always told me that the, uh, the founders of the uh, macrobiotic um, diet movement, always said you don't need to drink water if you eat enough fresh fruits and vegetables and i look at him thinking but you don't eat that many fresh fruits or vegetables right, and, right. Um, he, i it is i have heard it said that um plants are the best water filtering right absolutely. system so it it is true that eating lots of um fresh juicy fruits and vegetables right. Right. Um, yeah you probably if you eat enough of them but most people don't right right so that's, you probably, that's the thing so you do you, need to supplement you probably with a little bit of water don't get enough water if you're depending on the you know the fruits and vegetables and right. you're not eating the kind of diet where you are eating right a lot right of fruits so it's and good vegetables. To, it's, it's he's right to a certain degree but then he's not doing the, the thing and uh, he, he told me just recently that uh, he did a little yoga class and he said it was, he said it was a, supposed to be a beginner class. He said it was beyond a beginner class mm -hmm. really and he's been doing yoga all his life. But uh, he said two days later he said he was doubled over in pain. I'm like, what? Well, then it passed. He said, but then you know, a while later he said he was having all this pain and he's got kidney stones. Oh. So oh, yeah. maybe, well, you maybe hear not. a lot about 
that a large percentage of people are having kidney stone problems and gladder stone, gladder, right. bladder stone problems. Uh, you hear about those two things. A lot of people uh, have told me that they've had their gallbladders removed. Oh yeah. So yeah. yeah, I know. Even I know one friend of mine. Man, I was. Boy, I was I was still living up there. It was in the late nineties, and he's younger than me, and he had to have room. But again, to the emotional side, you, you've seen Louise Hay, the uh, uh, Heal Your Body uh, book, where he, she has like there's usually a emotional reason why you're having certain certain health problems. And I remember it was it was in the fall, and mm -hmm. I had just tasted some grapes, and I thought, wow, these are getting ripe. They're they're pretty sweet. And he's in the He's a flavor expert in the grape industry, and uh, uh, I said, "Hell, well, I guess you're going to be getting busy here soon." He's like, "What are you talking about?" No, oh, I just tried some grapes uh, today. I thought they were getting pretty sweet. Oh yeah, I had some. They were bitter. I thought they were bitter. I'm like, "Well, I mean, he's a flavor expert. I'm just a. I don't know what I'm talking about, right?" But but I they did, did taste good too. You well, know? yeah, they thought they tasted <laughs> sweet, and then he told me that he had to have his gallbladder removed, and I had the Louise Hay book right there on my my table, and I opened up to the gallbladder and she says bitterness, inner bitterness, blah, blah. I'm like, oh, isn't that interesting? That inner bitterness yeah, will cause food to taste bitter to No, me. well, I think it will cause gallbladder problems. Oh, gallbladder what it, what what it will problems. cause uh, down the road. Mm. But yeah, so I mean, I, I just, you know, I, I mean, we, we all know too, of course, I, I think that uh, our, our fast food places are not serving us the the healthiest food no, and, and really no. like any any processed food i mean when you go into the grocery store any of those middle aisles where everything's in boxes or in cans and stuff mm -hmm. like that well even him that the guy that i i mentioned that uh with the the gallbladder stuff works in the juice industry and uh he said, well, he says, you know, I get it once in a while for the kids. He said, but he says, he said, the stuff we make, and you know, it's fortified with vitamin C and stuff like that. He said, but it's basically sugar water. I mean, that's mm -hmm. what we're selling. Mm -hmm. uh, he said, if you want to drink a juice that actually has some health giving properties to your, isn't as, you know, sugary is tomato juice or V8, something like that mm -hmm. is a, is a juice that, you know, isn't all sugary and mm -hmm. isn't going to uh, bring that in. But just as we were starting, I know I, I mentioned, uh, Michael Pollan and, and caffeine, and I know uh, I, I always laugh when I hear people say, "Well, I don't take any, I don't do any drugs or drink any alcohol." I'm like, "Well, what about coffee?" Well, well, yeah, I drink coffee, and it's like, "Well, caffeine is a pretty powerful drug, honestly." And uh, if you just Google Michael Pollan, Joe Rogan on caffeine, there's a, a video, and there's some somebody who said he's this guy was like the world's expert on on coffee and caffeine, and he said that in Europe in the 1460s was the year, or was that 10 year period, that decade, uh, Europe was introduced to coffee, tea, and chocolate all within that decade. Oh my gosh. And he said for, for hundreds of years, he said water wasn't really safe to drink because of the bacteria. So with the boiling process of making beer or other uh, alcoholic beverages, he said that it was actually safer to drink that. So he says for hundreds of years, he's almost everybody in Europe was either drunk or buzzed most of the time. He said oh, because gosh. even even kids were drinking hard cider and, and stuff. Well, you know, I heard that um, when chocolate was first introduced, you know, to parts of the world where they'd never had it before, mm -hmm. like in Europe, mm -hmm. like you say, there was that point in history where they were putting chocolate in all kinds of things. They were putting it in pasta. Right. They were eating it with their their meat and all right. kinds of things because they liked it so much, right. I guess. Right. But it, it, it was I don't I don't see it tasting good right. in and on itself. those things. Right. You know what I mean? I, I don't see well, but, uh, uh, liking Pol that mix. What Poland points out, though, he says, he says, with most other drugs, he said, there was never a before and after. He says, we've always had them. They were always there. You know, if you mm -hmm. think of like cannabis or, or you know, hallucinogenic mm -hmm. mushrooms or whatever, they were all, or cocaine. It was always there. Mm -hmm. It was always, you know, in those in those cultures. There wasn't like a before and after. He said, but with coffee, he said, 
he said people now had this whole different kind of a more up kind of a buzz than mm -hmm. they had had for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. And he said, and that's strangely, interestingly, when mathematics and things started to become more uh, <laughs> more prevalent because people could focus. And but he said this guy told him he said you have no idea your relationship to caffeine unless you quit completely for for three months for ninety days. And so Michael Pollan to to experiment he did it. And uh, he, said, he said, you know, writing, he said, is a very, like, linear kind of a thing. And he says, and I, I couldn't even write. He said, I had writer's block almost the entire time. But he said, when I eventually decided to, to, to stop after the 90 days, he said, well, I made my plan. And he says, but wow, he said, did I feel fantastic. And then he said, and I was thinking, well, geez, why don't I go to this market? Because they always... He said, I'm already thinking about my next cup while I'm drinking the first cup. And he's like, no, no, I, I don't want to start doing that. He said, I decided once a week I would have, have one cup of coffee uh, once a week. But he said when he had that first cup after 90 days, he said it was like the most intense drug experience he ever had. He was, he, I, and, and the same thing happened to me, except I quit for three years, and then I had a small cup. And I mean, I was shaking. I was so wired. It yeah, was just yeah. incredible. I'm thinking, people drink cup after cup of this stuff. Uh, every day, but and I'm not saying coffee in itself is horrible for you, and you should never drink it. But uh, again, uh, like alcohol, it's not a bad idea to take a break uh, once in a while too. No, I was never able to really drink coffee. My parents were gonna, my parents were gonna let me start drinking coffee when I was a teenager, and it just did not work out for me. I, I just couldn't do it because I mean it would make me so nervous and anxious that. Literally, I couldn't function. You well, know, I don't know what it was, but my parents gave us starting first grade. I got a cup of coffee every every morning for breakfast. And then when I went to, into high school, I was like, "Why am I drinking coffee? I don't think I need this." But then when I went to college, everybody was drinking coffee. So when we'd go out to breakfast, I'd have a, a, a one or two cups of coffee with breakfast, maybe once or twice a week. And uh, I had a naturopath, uh, iridologist, look at my irises, and the first thing he said is like, "We got to get you off the caffeine habit." I'm like. I might drink two to four cups a week. Well, he says, it's there. He says, you, you've got an overload. Oh, and, the iridologist. Um, yeah, you know, having an iridologist look at your eyes, you would swear you were in the presence of a psychic. Oh, I know. Uh, you I know mean, what I mean? He, I mean, they look at your he, eyes. He told me my health history. I mean, he said, first thing, he said, you had swollen glands and took an antibiotic when you were about five years old. I'm like, oh, my God, yeah, right when I started kindergarten. Uh, so, I mean, he knew that. I, I forgot, you know, I mm -hmm. forgot that I had even done that, but he knew, yeah, he mm -hmm. knew my, my health history just by looking at my irises. Yeah, um, <laughs> it, it's amazing what they can tell you. In fact, the, um, the last time I went for my annual eye checkup back in September, I, I was asking my eye doctor, I, I asked her, I said, have you ever heard of iridology? Mm -hmm. And she goes, oh, yes. Um, and then she went on to say, she went on to say just by examining our eyes at our annual checkups, she can tell if a person has high blood pressure, if they're diabetic, if they have this problem or that problem, just from examining our eyes at our eye checkups. Mm -hmm. You know, if somebody became diabetic, she could prob and they didn't know it yet, you know, she could probably tell them and send them to doc the doctor to look into it. Right, right. So, yeah, I know that where it, it kind of started, there was a German boy, Ignaz von Pelsky, and uh, he, I think, caught a owl when he was a, a child. And he caught it? Somehow he, it, it was wounded, it was injured, oh. but he saw it get injured, and he was so fascinated by its eyes that when the wing was broken, he said he saw this black spike come out of the part of the eye, and he just was fascinated by that. So wow. then he became an eye doctor, and he studied people's uh -huh. eyes for you know, his entire uh, career, and he was one of the first to come up with the, the iridology map, for because it's different from oh, eye oh, to that, eye, Oh, that too. was who came up with he it? He was the original, um, yeah, or one of the original uh, people in the Western world. Cause I, I think the Chinese were using eye reading mm -hmm. uh, way before that, too. Um, but well, you know, um, there was a naturopathic doctor that I used to go to, and it was amazing the things he could tell me about myself by feeling my pulse. Oh, that too, yeah. You know, they, 
they just know all kinds of yeah, stuff. Yeah, acupuncture checks my yeah. pulses every time I go, and yeah. he checks them. And then after he kneels me and removes them, he goes back and checks them again just to, yeah. just to see where they're at. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, it's it's just <laughs> I don't understand it. Just mesmerizes me that people can uh, can learn to do that stuff. It right. must be hard to learn. But anyway, getting back to the soda pop. Um, we were talking about the artificial sweeteners and like that um, that are in some of the pop. And you know people who drink it thinking they're going to lose weight don't lose weight? Doesn't look like it, no. <laughs> no. Not only that, but um, you know with the artificial sweeteners can cause a person to develop uh, multiple sclerosis symptoms. Right, exactly. I know we talked about that before because I had the one, one lady as a client and mm -hmm. uh, she must have been in her mid fifties, and then suddenly she's got MS symptoms, and she she brought it up. She was talking about um, mm -hmm. um, diet soda and how one of her friends drinks like a two liter every day. I'm like, wow, and um, yeah. she's like, well, she goes, I'm not saying I don't drink it. She goes, I, uh, but I only have a can a day. I'm like, Wait, you have a can a day? Uh, wow, and you know, for yeah. like thirty years, she's had a can a can of you diet know, soda a day. Some people drink pop instead of water. Right. You know, and um, a couple of other things that I learned when I was kind of looking into natural healing for uh, cancer and the Hoxi Natural Cancer Therapy people never let their patients drink carbonated beverages uh, because the uh, carbonated uh, stuff causes a deficiency of oxygen in yeah, a person's body. Yeah, you're putting body. CO2 in your body for sure. And then there's uh, there's also, they a lot of it contains phosphoric acid, which they said is the uh, active ingredient in toilet bowl cleaner. I was going to say, you, you, I, I used to have a whole thing and it was like, you know, the difference between water and soda, but they told some of the things that you could do. They said if, if you really, if you want to clean out your, your toilet bowl, they said pour, 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 pop a, they in said, it? pour, pour a, a can of, they said the real thing in and there and let it soak a little bit. They, they claim if you, if you have like rust on your bumper of your car, you can take, you know, mm -hmm. Pepsi or Coke and put mm -hmm. it on some foil, some tin foil and rub it mm -hmm. and it'll re replenish that. They, they say that, I want to say, I think it's Pepsi uses the pure, um, syrup before they they blend it um they use that to clean the engines of their delivery trucks oh wow um, is the, well the, the coke yeah syrup. i remember <coughs> when i was in high school though i worked in a diner the last two summers before i graduated from high school and i remember at the end of the evening uh we would uh you take a bottle of pop to clean the grease off of the uh, grill. Makes sense, yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, you know, it's funny though, I, I wanna say that I, I've, I've heard, had people, a couple of people tell me this, that you know, some, some guy at work was told by the doctor, it's like, you know, your blood pressure, everything, you, you, gotta, you gotta get away from the coffee. Mm -hmm. And my friend said he goes into this guy's cubicle and he says he's got a cooler there. He's like, what are you doing? And he's, oh, he's, he's drinking Pepsi now. He's like, what? He says, but, he says, but the doctor said no more coffee. He's like, but, <laughs> it's like this is even worse for you than the coffee, but the doctor yeah, said no coffee, yeah, he didn't say no uh, soda. Another, another person told me say, similarly that the guy's like, I can't, I can't go without it. So he's, he's taking no dose, so he's taking caffeine pills, but not drinking coffee oh, anymore. Because well, the doctor said no coffee. I have heard that you should not let children drink uh, caffeinated beverages. Mm, or, or, or so, uh, soda pop is what it one of oh, the no, things that I, I has caffeine. I think I was caffeine. in an airport one time and the guy gave his, I swear the girl looked like she was about eight or nine years old, he gave her some money to go get a, a, a drink or something like that and she came back with a Red Bull and the father's like, oh my God. you got a Red Bull? I was like, when I was eight years old, I didn't need more energy from a Red Bull. <laughs> I know. Some kids just can't stop moving, <laughs> even without all of that right, stuff. Right, yeah. right. I mean, I can't even imagine a kid needing, you know, a, a highly caffeinated uh, mm -hmm. beverage like that. But, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm, I'll also, you know, we wanted to talk about some of the toxic things. I, I think, you know, honestly, you know, pretty much any any processed food, but also I think the medications that a lot of people end up mm -hmm. taking have 
they don't really heal you of any problem. I mean, they reduce your symptoms or re remove your symptoms. But mm -hmm. even I've I've read that uh, Tylenol will cause men to have erection dysfunction or erectile dysfunction. Oh, is that right? Tylenol? So I mean, you know, mm -hmm. people are like, oh, it's just Tylenol. What's the big deal? But um, yeah, uh, they're, yeah, they're, you know, now. Um, you know, for a while there, they were recommending that people take an aspirin every day to prevent having a heart attack. Right. Now, doctors have switched over to telling their patients that uh, you shouldn't unless you've already had, mm. like, a heart attack or, or something. Uh, now they, they, because there's problems that are caused by aspirin and, and, and it, you know you know what else will dilate your your blood vessels what and what cayenne pepper doctor okay. do, do, dr barnes used to if he had, if he literally had someone at his office that was going into cardiac arrest he would put cayenne pepper on their tongue wow wow yeah it, yeah it, i mean it, you, you know it, it it's a it, it dilates your blood vessels and uh makes your circulation uh better so mm-hmm but yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, we went through this list before, but the, the list of different uh, ailments that you can get from just poor diet and mm -hmm. uh, I mean, ulcerative colitis is even uh, a part of that. Uh, acid reflux, uh, which I've read that acid reflux is not that you have too much acid, it's too little acid mm -hmm. actually. And I never get that, but once I went to this uh, Mexican place and they had this their, their hot sauce is, they bring it to you in this bowl of like steaming stuff. And I don't know what it was about it, but that, I remember that night I was like, <clears throat> I just kept feeling like, I, I was like, boy, I just feel like I have, I never have acid reflux. And uh, remember the book that came out, I don't know, probably over 20 years ago. It was that, um, oh, what your doctors don't want you to know about uh, certain oh, yeah. health things. It was a Trudeau, yeah. I want to say, was his last yeah. name. But, he said, he said, if you're feeling like that, he said, instead of going out and getting that Pepsi or, you know, whatever drug it is, he said, he said, drink a tablespoon of apple cider vinegar. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to do one better. I got the shot glass out, poured a, set myself a shot of apple cider vinegar. I drank it. Within 15 minutes, I'm like, but it, I have, my symptoms are almost completely gone. So 20 minutes later, I took another shot and that was it. And uh, mm -hmm. I know a friend out in California, she was having issues with it. And they were talking about putting her on medication. I'm like, get apple cider vinegar. She got the apple cider vinegar, said it calmed her stomach so much that she was able to actually sleep for the first time in three days. Yeah, I can't think offhand uh, what the problems are, but I have heard that you know, the drugs that are prescribed to people for acid reflux, there are uh, certain uh, health conditions that are caused by those drugs. Oh, sure, yeah. Yeah, well, you know, the, you, you hear that, you know, from time to time. Well, you see it on, on some of the ads on, on TV. It's like it could cause, this drug can cause all these other problems. Mm -hmm. So you go in for one problem, you have you get one drug, but then that drug causes you to have two other symptoms, so now they have to put you on two other drugs for the mm -hmm. symptoms of the first drug. That um, are caused by the first drug. And I know, yeah. like, even with, with chemo, I know my, my friend, which, you know, obviously is not healthy for you, but uh, I know my friend Tom uh, said uh, at one point, who he did pass away, like, in 2011, he said, you know, he says, if I, if I keep taking the chemo, he said, I'm going to, the chemo is going to kill me. He says, but if I don't take the chemo, the, um, the cancer is going to kill him. The cancer is yeah. going to get me. But and that's it. He, he never had any heart problems, but he he died of congestive heart failure, which was a side effect of the chemo, uh, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. you know fairly common actually. Yeah, uh, you know actually, um, uh, how many people do you know who've had cancer and went the medical route and died anyway? Yeah, well, and it seems to me <laughs> yeah. it, what I have been noticing the pattern that I see is that. They go through the the surgery, the chemo, the radiation, mm -hmm. and now they're 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 symptom free, they're they're cancer free. And then, and then, then two years later, they have another type of cancer. Right, right, and then they die. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, so I I mean, uh, I lost my youngest brother um, to um, the side effects of chemotherapy mm -hmm. drugs. Um, I know that's what he died from because of the the fact that he was uh, throwing up bile mm. for the whole last week of his life. And, and that is uh, a side effect of 
uh, chemotherapy drugs. And well, I'm pretty sure that's what killed my mom. They, they convinced us in September of 1983 that if she had these four or five chemo treatments, she would live another 15 to 20 years. So we're like, well, I mean, no brainer, right? I mean, why wouldn't she get the chemo? Because mm -hmm. she's going to live another 15 or 20 years. She got the fourth chemo treatment and died three days later. So, oh, um, it was oh. like she, she didn't even she didn't live four months basically after they they said mm -hmm. she lived fifteen to twenty years. Well, you know, I uh, knew somebody uh, who had advanced breast cancer when they first figured out she had it, and maybe you know who I'm talking about mm -hmm. because she mm -hmm. was got somewhat famous for it. Uh, the doctors told her that they could give her a year of life with aggressive therapy. Well, she decided not to bother and went to an herbalist and went on a raw foods diet and, you know, just was very strict with herself and wound up living, uh, without any medical treatment that is, and wound up living nine more years hmm. compared to the one year that the medical profession said they could give her with um, aggressive cancer therapy mm -hmm. so well, there's you know. the one the one woman that comes to the vegetarian society meetings I think she's in her 90s if she's still alive but uh, she always talked about how her husband got cancer in the early 60s and he was so convinced that these doctors knew what they were doing but she was just like why don't you listen to this guy and, mm -hmm. oh no I go to this guy and I don't think he lived long after that well mm -hmm. she always said she was real super sensitive to, to drugs anyway and she ended up with I think colon cancer in the late 1960s and she says, I'm not going to go and do that. And she, I think she found it. She said she found a doctor in New York City. And I remember I was talking about the, the mushrooms, the uh, healing power of mushrooms. And she said that he would put her on an I, a vitamin IV, and there was cordyceps mushrooms in the IV. And yeah. she got over the cancer in the late 60s. And here she, I don't know, yeah, when, uh, I don't okay. know a couple of years ago, she was still at the Vegetarian Society meetings and yeah. in her 90s and still okay and never, never did the chemo. Well, apparently some uh, natural <laughs> healers uh, can give you intravenous injections of uh, vitamin C is supposed oh, to yeah. help right. uh, kill Well, and kill you know what else is, um, uh, that Dr. Barnes uh, always used to do that too, and, and he told me this. Um, they give you a intravenous hydrogen, uh, food grade hydrogen peroxide, and that will, he says it hyperoxygenates your body, it will kill bacteria, viruses, and even cancer. And uh, just a uh, personal note, what happened, Dr. Barnes came to my office for a massage once, and uh, my dog had symptoms that the vet wasn't able, she wasn't telling me what was going on, but uh, I said, you know, I hate to bother you while you're here for an appointment, but I said, what do you think is going on? Like, Bill, he says, it sounds like a chronic degenerative problem. He said, I bet you that dog has a brain tumor. Oh, my gosh. And I said, well, what would you do? He said, do you have food-grade hydrogen peroxide? I said, well, I think they have it at the health food store down in James. He said, if you can't get it, he said, I have it at my office. And I'm like, well, it was $10 for a quart, so mm -hmm. I just went to him, got it. And That's a pretty good uh, amount of hydrogen peroxide. Oh, yeah, peroxide. well, because he said, he said, every day, if you can, he says, try to put five drops in a cup of water and try to get him to drink that. And I mean, he's drinking tons of water. So I, I got it from him at lunch and I went to his office and I got it at lunchtime. And I was like, well, the bowl that I use is a ceramic bowl and it held, held 12 cups. I'm like, 12 times five drops, I guess is 60. I'm like, I gotta get to work. And I just poured some into the cap of the bottle and I poured it into the dog's water, capped it back up. I came home, it was like that dog never had any problems at all. It was like, I'm like, I think I better start measuring this stuff, <laughs> and I did, and he and he just got better and better and better. But then I got to the point, and, I, and he and he stopped drinking a lot of water. And he's mm -hmm. like, "Oh, can you imagine what that tastes like?" And I'm like, "I'm going to try it." So I took eight ounces of water, put the drops in it. Like I couldn't taste thing. Now I don't have a taste buds of a dog, but um, it it didn't taste like anything. But after. Because he, he said, then add one drop per day up until you're giving him 25 drops to a cup of water every day. And I got to that, but then he, Dr. Barnes was on vacation. I'm like, I don't know. Do I just keep giving him this stuff? I stopped giving it to him. His symptoms came back. And when I talked to Barnes, he's like, no, no, keep giving it to him. Keep giving it to him. And when I got him back on it again, it just, it just didn't work the second time. Oh, and, really? And he, did, 
he did succumb. Well, I I had him uh, euthanized eventually, but it was mm -hmm. you know, there was mm -hmm. he wasn't doing really good at that point. But you know, he he did mm -hmm. actually. Uh, but you know, the other doctors were just like um, wanting him on on you know to get MRIs and chemo and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, um, yeah, never did that to a dog. Well, we're getting a bit off the topic here. <laughs> yes. It's really interesting, but um, okay. Well, uh, I guess we we're talking about chemo and the and the, yeah. the, the toxicity of things that uh, yeah. people will get put um, in their bodies from that. But a couple of other things uh, that are in a lot of foods these days that are not good for you are like high fructose corn syrup and uh, parsley partially hydrogenated fats right, right. are, are well, a couple of things yeah, that again are from really you know a lot of the fast food places have have all that stuff in them and then the uh, the processed foods really and that's where I think a lot of people get involved you know they go for the easy thing the thing that's prepared that they can just warm up or or whatever the the TV mm -hmm. dinner or something mm -hmm. like that but uh, um, you know it it's it's a little bit more work, as you know, to cook your own food at home. But that's the one thing that, that Michael Pollan says in, in one of his uh, uh, videos. He says, you know, he says, he, he said, you know, he talked to this one, one diet food expert. He says, you know what, he says, the one thing he says, I'll say, he says, eat whatever you want. He said, but cook it at home. Cook whatever you're going to cook at home. Mm -hmm. And, you know, from, you know, basically from scratch. And he says, you know, like right there alone, he says you're you're going to be probably eating less. You're not going to be eating as many preservatives or the the, the high fructose corn syrup isn't going to be in there. Your um, uh, preservatives aren't going to be in it. Uh, but uh, I, you know, they, of course, you know, we've talked. I think before too. They say that they took. Wasn't it like? Was it in the 40s or 50s? Somebody took a McDonald's cheeseburger and just like put it in some glass box, and they say it really doesn't look hardly any different than it did you know, 80 years ago, it still still looks just like a McDonald's cheeseburger because it's preservatives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but you know, so I mean, from, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm being inspired to uh, <laughs> do, a, do a 28 day cleanse myself, but, uh, uh -huh. uh, and you know, really, I mean, if you just think about fresh fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, uh, legumes, like that. right, the um, beans, yeah. But uh, I know we did talk to about earlier where we were saying I, I, I w doing some research on this. They talked about the, the toxins that are naturally in in some foods, and I have elderberry plants bushes on my property. Uh, uh -huh. But uh, it seems like once they're ripe, the birds get them really, really quickly. But mm -hmm. they said unripe elderberries or the elderberry bark is actually toxic to us. And uh, I know Bernard Jensen too. That you, you read about. Um, uh, rhubarb and people say oh you don't eat the leaves you only eat the stems but i've heard that and yeah. he he ex bernard and I'm, i was never a big fan of rhubarb so i've read bernard jensen he says you know what he says there's less of it in less of the toxin in the stems he said but it's still there i'm like that's all i needed here so i don't eat rhubarb yeah anymore. some people are uh really sensitive to uh, nightshade poison, right. which you find in potatoes and tomatoes yeah, and, peppers and peppers and eggplant. Yep. Yep. And uh, also, I know a lot of people that they there. I read a book years ago, and they said this is how to how to cure your arthritis. And there was a actually a, a story. It was an Amish doctor uh, who went down to I want to say Peru, and they he was buying potatoes at the at the farmers market and taking them back, and boiling them up, and eating eating potatoes at his room. Well. It turns out that within, I don't know, some short amount of time, he got such severe uh, arthritic symptoms that he went to a doctor and they're like, you can take about 30 to 40 aspirins a day, but I mean, you have severe rheumatoid arthritis. And he's like, this can't be, it can't be right. When he came back to the States and he did find out it was, that's what it was. But it turns out that they don't hill their potatoes like we do, so the potatoes were green, so they have that oh. toxin in them. And but where was this, did you I say? I think it was in Peru, which is Peru? where most potatoes originated. But what they would do is they would process them, so they would boil the potatoes, mash them, spread them out onto wax paper, dry it, and make potato flour and use the potato flour in their ingredients. And by the boiling and then the draining off of the water and then the mashing, the drying, it would get rid of that, that toxin. And oh. so that's how they were eating the potatoes, but he was just cooking them and eating them. Mm -hmm. But he did actually, uh, after he came back in the States, he started taking certain homeopathic remedies that were to, to cleanse his body and a lot of like 
uh, fresh, like carrot. I remember carrot and beet juices were uh, supposed to be very cleansing, and it, it did eventually turn him around. I mean, it, it took a few months before he could straighten himself around, but it was just, you know. And, and I, I had uh, one massage therapist that I know, she's like, you, you can't grow your own potatoes. You'll get solanacea poisoning. I'm like, what? Solanacea? Well, that's what the other name for nightshades are, solanacea. Oh, okay. And I'm like, I, I've never had solanacea poisoning. I've been growing potatoes all my life. Well, I don't know. Well, you, you know, sometimes I think people will dig up their potatoes and then they want, them, they want them to cure a little bit and they'll leave them out in the sun. Well, I think if you leave them out That for increases day, the nightshade poison, Yeah, right? it makes them green. And I, I, I used to, you know, if I have a nice big potato and a little corner of it's green. I used to cut that part off. But I've read now, they said that the poison, even though it's only green in one spot, they said it goes throughout the whole potato. So it's well, good to Well, you know, um, people who have rheumatoid arthritis should be tested for food allergies mm. because I've, I've heard that food allergies can cause um, rheumatoid arthritis. And you know, if you keep eating the offending food, you're gonna get it and then it's gonna get worse and worse and worse. Right, right. Well, like I was saying, the guy who wrote this book, this Scott Olgren, he said from you know the time he grew up, he said, I ate what everybody else in my community ate. I have cold cereal and milk for breakfast. I have cold cuts on white bread with mayonnaise for, for, for lunch. And he said from the age of like 13, he said he was taking antibiotics for, for his acne over and over. He said he, he must have been 30 years old before somebody said, if you would quit eating that, it would clear up your face. And he was like... Yeah, and then uh, uh, the microbiome in our guts, uh, if you're taking... Um, if you're taking antibiotics all the time, you don't have any good bacteria mm -hmm. left in, in your body. And, and you hear like a lot of people that have certain symptoms after they've taken a long course of antibiotics, like did anybody tell you to take a probiotic after that? And nobody does, and, or you know, they, won't, they don't tell you to eat yogurt or anything like that. A lot, mm -hmm. I mean some, a lot of doctors won't, won't tell you that. But uh, I know uh, I actually had a really kind of a strange uh, infection, which is really rare for me, but in 08, spring of 08, I had these rose bushes around my new house that had been trimmed in years, and mm -hmm. I had the, the, the leather gloves with the double leather palms to, for working with rose bushes, but I was just trimming everything and putting all the debris into the bucket of my tractor. I remember mm -hmm. I got one little poke here and one in the middle of my, mm -hmm. my, uh, my mm -hmm. hand, and um, it just turned a little bit pink, a little bit red. I didn't even think anything of it, but mm -hmm. It was like a few weeks later, I'm like, oh man, I mean, I've been doing a lot of chainsawing and throwing wood and splitting wood. I'm like, this arm, it, it just, it wouldn't, it was a little bit sore all the time, but if I went to straighten, it was like, oh boy, is that thing sore. And uh, one night I was taking a shower and I was having me in front of the mirror and I was drying off. I'm like, what is that? And I had this raised area that went down my arm, and if I pulled my hand back, there was, it looked like veins, but it wasn't where my veins were. And I'm thinking, I have an infection in my lymph system. Oh my gosh, and, um, that can be very dangerous. Well, I got yeah. a hold of my alternative doctor, uh -huh. and uh, I, uh, she, well, the first thing she she gets on the phone with me, and she's like, uh, "So, how's it going?" I'm like, "Well, you know, it was better." And she says, "Well, uh, been out in the garden." I'm like, "Well, you know me." She goes, "Handle any rose bushes?" I'm like, "Yeah." As a matter of fact, it was just over three weeks ago. She was like, "Wow." She goes, that, that's a testament to your really powerful immune system. She goes, most people, she goes, you can look it up. She goes, it's called the Rose Gardener's Infection. She goes, wow. it happens in the Northeast never United heard States. Of it. She goes, there's a, there's a bacteria that grows on roses. And she goes, no one's immune to it. She goes, no one. She goes, usually oh within gosh. three or four days, she goes, you're in the hospital. Uh, but she goes, I got to put you on an antibiotic. And in fact, she gave me a week and I was at Dairy Ells for a private uh, yoga lesson. It was like, I had one day left, my stomach was all messed up from the, from the antibiotics. Mm -hmm. I was just really looking forward to stopping the next day and Michael <clears throat> came in and I said, hey, what do you think about this? He said, she gave you a week? And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, he said, for a deep infection like that, he's I usually go at least 10, 10 to 14 days. So mm -hmm. where do you get your prescription filled? So he filled it again, but or he signed me in it for another one, mm -hmm. which I didn't like, but I, I gotta do this. Mm -hmm. But she told me, the alternative doctor told me, she goes, if you're taking that that pill, let's say at um, you know 7 a.m. and 7 p.m., she says six hours later, so at 1 p.m. and at 1 a.m. if you can, 
she was take a really good high quality probiotic because mm -hmm. I want to say it was at Yale they did a study and they found that if you act because I was always thinking well what's the point of taking a probiotic if you're taking the antibiotic but if you take it like in between, mm -hmm. it actually makes the antibiotic work better because of course you have good internal flora for half of the day before mm -hmm. you take the pill again. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, yeah, the probiotic with the antibiotic actually makes the antibiotic work better. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, but I think, you know, really most of us have super poor digestion anyway. So a probiotic or like we've done the shows on eating probiotic foods, the sauerkrauts, the the kimchi, mm -hmm. the pickles, the things like that that you know do have probiotics in them, are uh, are all you know beneficial for the uh, internal flora as well. And I think you get more out of it. I, I think I, I I gave you that little thing that had beet juice or, or whatever. But they say that uh, just taking a sip of a fermented product like that. And I know I know you've had Terry Beck on here before the acupuncturist. And yeah, only he, once. I'd like to have him on again sometime. We. Uh, we uh, we talked about it, but he, he said, Bill, he said, I had to read this over and over again. He says, I, I can't believe this, but they said that one forkful of fresh probiotic um, sauerkraut has more probiotics in it than a whole bottle of probiotic pills that you would buy. Hmm. And so taking even a sip of a probiotic drink is going to just you know, bathe your entire digestive system in uh, um, good probiotics. and." That's just before you eat food, so it's going to mm -hmm. help you digest uh, mm -hmm. that much better. But, um, but yeah, I think you know we we really have gotten away from you know what is a natural diet, and that's I know uh, Jensen talked about um, you know they they interviewed so many people, and this is you know I mean I didn't, he died probably over twenty years ago, around twenty years ago, and he was over a hundred years old. But uh, um, I want to say like he they questioned people even like back in the the forties and fifties. Well, he himself. Bernard Jensen actually, uh, he said, you know, he said, I was pushing myself. I'm, you know, going to, going to chiropractic school. I'm working, I'm, you know, working a, a side job. And he says, basically, he says, I was living on coffee and danishes. He said, that's what everybody ate back then. And he said, the year after he finished school, he said he was pushing himself so hard. He said he ended up in the hospital yeah. because he got yeah. so sick from, from eating the... Uh, if, if all you're doing is eating danishes yeah, and, sweet and stuff coffee, and, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it keeps yeah. you going, but it's yeah. not really um, a... Yeah, it's, it's not healthy. One thing I do have to say is uh, that the one time that I was told that I had thyroid cancer, um, for the first two months, I didn't let them take uh, the thyroid gland out. Mm -hmm. And uh, for the first two months, and it was easy because it was during the growing season, you know, so um, I ate pretty much only raw foods, mm -hmm. raw plant foods for a couple of months. And honestly, uh, if you, uh, um, it was the most energy. I mean, it was like literally the best I ever, the best I ever felt, mm -hmm. really just, just eating only raw foods. Yeah. Uh, I know there's one it's, one lady up at Lilydale, and I, I saw her, and she was in her, in her 90s and still doing really well. And somebody said, she juices everything. She doesn't eat anything. She somebody would give her a zucchini, and I'm like, zucchini juice. I was like, all right, I guess if that mm -hmm. works. But she would just be basically eat everything raw, and and you know juice everything. I, I personally don't know if I could do that, but mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. um, I and I I have to say I do like some protein once in a while, but. But that's the thing too, like, and I know you were saying it, and it's funny how people, how like you, the, you were saying like the women bodybuilders, a lot of them are, are vegan. I have gone vegan, yeah. yeah. Um, one, one friend of mine, I don't even know where he got this, he's like, well, you know, that's the thing, he said, you read about it, is all these women bodybuilders are all dying, they're dropping like flies because, you know, they push themselves and they, they, they take all these diuretics, and I'm like, is that true? Because, I mean, I follow a number of like uh, well, International Federation of Bodybuilders. Um, I think that a certain amount of bodybuilders eat, they eat way too much meat, you know. Uh, I think it used to be, but I'm not really because, sure. Because, uh, But he was saying the vegan women were the one, we, yeah. vegan women bodybuilders. Well, I looked it up, and in the last, like, several years, there's literally been, like, five. You know, it's like, uh, okay, so five people out of, like, a group of thousands <laughs> that... Yeah, I, I don't know why that would have would have been unless they were i mean you can eat a plant plant-based food that's junk food 
Right. It, it, because uh, it's considered vegan because... Well, potato well, chips are plant-based. So. Yeah, but it, it's not healthy plant-based food. Right. You know, it, it, in order for it to keep you healthy and strong, it has to be um, whole foods that are not processed. Right, right. Well, I think, you know, most of them do, you know, actually eat pretty well. But, you know, it's like, to me, what he was saying, he was making it sound like, you know, like like 25% of them just died off in the last couple of months. And like I said, I looked it up and it was like, a, like a, you know, like a handful mm -hmm. of people had, had passed away. But, um, yeah, you know, I don't know where he was getting his information from. But he was also someone who told me years ago, he said, yeah, you know, this whole thing about red wine being so good for you. Some doctor that he fo followed said that it's ridiculous it's because they did this, the flaw, the study was flawed because they gave the, the wine to mice and they it was like the equivalent of like you would have to drink two cases of wine a day to do that. And I'm just like, wasn't the studies done in Europe where people drink wine every day? It wasn't yeah, done, studies weren't done yeah. with mice. Well, you know, uh, it used to be for a, a long time they have been saying, you know, as far as alcoholic beverages in general, uh, one serving a day for women and two for men. Now they've expanded the sentence to, if at all, Right. You know, so, uh, I mean, you're a lot better off if you're just drinking <clears throat> water or herbal teas, which right. is basically all, pretty much all I ever drink. Is right. Yeah, pretty much water <laughs> for me. I mean, I, I, I did actually, I probably have had three three beers this year. Uh, but, mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, it, well, and, you know, alcohol, obviously a toxin, but... Uh, mm -hmm. You know, in moderation, I don't think it's it's so horrible. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, sometimes you see you see people that are like kind of smaller women that are you know they're they're, they're going to drink like five six glasses of wine a day. Yeah, um, I've heard that like some people, um, instead of having a drink every day, they'll you know go without an alcoholic beverage, and then on the weekend, pig out on it. Mm, yeah. But I've Binging. heard that it's better. I've heard that that's worse than having one drink a day. Right. Uh, than binging, drinking. Right. Yeah, the binging uh, once, once definitely. Once a week, so. Now, I, I did see a thing once on um, um, Dr. Oz, and I thought it was interesting, but they were talking about, you know, all these women, just like, oh, I just have a couple glass, one glass of chill wine every night with, with dinner, and they showed what these women would look like in their mid-30s if they had a glass or two of wine every night with dinner. And, and they were saying, they we're not saying don't drink at all, but every year if you could take 30 days off, just take a month off. They said it, it makes a huge difference to your liver, your kidneys. It just helps things replenish as opposed to just like constantly, constantly doing it. Now I would say with what you were saying about the binging, I mean, if you didn't drink all week and you only had one or two, on the weekend nights, that probably wouldn't be so bad, but uh, to put away 12 or, or something like that yeah, is not yeah. so great. Yeah, I, I guess some people uh, were doing that because they, they thought it was better than having it every day, but if you're drinking a whole bunch of it on right. the weekend or whatever, then that's not good. Yes, I, I agree. I mean, I, I think, you know, again, moderation, I think, is the key in a lot of, a lot of cases, but... Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, 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 I actually myself, I remember when I was in college and probably wasn't eating perfectly. I mean, I was a vegetarian at the time, but I remember I would always get this like dry, scaly skin On around my elbows. elbows. And yeah. my, my, some of my friends had the same thing. And we always used to, you know, we went, we're going to college in Buffalo. We, really, yeah, we call it the Buffalo disease, Buffalo disease, because you'd go away for a weekend and it would go away. You know, you, you know, you'd come back home, it would go away and it, it would come back. Well. After I graduated, I had it consistently, and I, I don't have the book here, but it's a book called like Healing with Natural Foods, and very very simple. They had a they had a um, a chapter on the skin, and I remember I was doing three things that they no four things that they they recommended, and uh, I swear within four days it cleared up and it never came back, but it was uh, cold pressed organic corn oil. I would think I was taking a tablespoon of that every day. Uh, like a teaspoon of blackstrap molasses, handful of sunflower seeds, and 
a handful of the, the dried uh, apricots. And uh, again, you know, it was, it's not like I continued to eat those things, but after I did it for you know some, just a few days, it cleared up and it went away. And you never had the problem Never had again. it again. Never wow. Came back. Yeah. Wow. So I mean, uh, obviously uh, diet is uh, super, super uh, important. Um, but the one thing I was mentioning, I started to mention earlier, but the, the toxicities in some natural foods, like um, we said, uh, Cashews are actually in the same family as poison ivy. Yep, they are, yeah. And, and I have, I did know that for a number of years, but uh, they said, you know, it's it's really not true when you go to the store and it says raw cashews. They said there's no such thing as a raw cashew. They all have yeah, to be steamed. Because they can't actually touch the plant because otherwise they'd get a poison ivy like rash. I know there's, there's a fruit something that about grows that they have too. to steam. Uh, do something like steam um, it to get the cashews to drop out because they can't can't touch the rest of right. the plant. Right. Yeah. But mangoes are also in the same family. I so didn't they, know they that. They say you can't eat the mango skin uh, either. I was like, well, that's I didn't know that, but that that does make sense too. But I was uh, I mentioned earlier elderberries. I have elderberries on my property, and they said that the unripe elderberry and the elderberry bark is also uh, toxic mm -hmm. uh, to us. But I mean, I, I, you probably know, I mean, Yule Gibbons used to talk about eating poison ivy. You can actually eat poison ivy itself, but it's like spinach, but you have to, you have to cook it, drain off the water, cook it again, drain off the water, three, three changes of water to get the, uh, mm -hmm. the toxicity Well, you know, out of it. There, there are certain kinds of animals that eat um, poison ivy, I, deer, are one of them, and I heard that goats will eat poison ivy Possibly. also. And you know what's funny about about um, you ever you know what comfrey is the, the yeah comfrey? I do yeah. Um, I was reading someplace years ago how it was used as like an animal forage, but there's some kind of a, a toxin in it that we're not supposed to eat it green either. I remember Darielle saying that they oh when she was in the ashram they used to juice it and. I was wondering, some people didn't seem so healthy when they were eating it, but there's something about it needs to wilt a little bit, and then that's uh, the, whatever the acid or the, the, the stuff that's in it that's bad um, goes away like fairly quickly. It's very unstable, but the stuff has to be wilted a little bit. And my one friend had, had a comfrey plant, and he had a pygmy goat. I said, the goat never eats this? I was like, no, it's supposed to be good for, for wildlife or for, or for livestock, mm -hmm. really. He went over and he cut some of it. He tried to give it to the goat. The goat sniffed it, walked away from it. Hmm. He just left it there in the sun. A few minutes later, the stuff had wilted. The goat went over there and ate it all up. Like he could, he knew that the toxin was gone he, after it he wilted. He knew the right moment all that right. he well, could it, eat you know, it. Maybe, maybe by the smell or something, but mm -hmm. he, he was able to eat it. He, he wouldn't even touch it, like not even take a nibble of it when it was fresh and green. But when it, was, when it sat there and wilted for a little bit, it... Uh, it um, Apparently was more palatable, or mm -hmm. he knew that it was okay. But uh, well, um, um, you brought some books in. Uh, were you gonna uh, tell the? Um, uh, oh, I don't know. I just brought the foods that heal. Uh, Andrew Weil. Uh, I mean uh, <laughs> Bernard Jensen, mm -hmm. world-renowned uh, uh, food healer. And uh, I mean, he, he talks about how you know he's he's a doctor, but he doesn't treat people like with with medications or surgeries. It's just mm -hmm. it's all about diet and he says most of the people that came in with chronic chronic illnesses um, did clear up but uh, um, you know and he goes back to Hippocrates if your food oh, is yeah. your medicine let your medicine be, be your, your food. food but I mean if you look at the the, the cover uh, it's it's, a, all it's, vegetables. A, it's the doctor's bag with all the vegetables <laughs> around it uh, basically but the uh, yeah. um, the 28-day uh, cleanse uh, we were saying that there's all these symptoms that are basically come from a poor diet and uh, mm -hmm. um, and it, it was kind of interesting too I, I know we mentioned this earlier that there was somebody that was doing a cleanse and they they felt so good but they they thought they were gonna cheat one day and they went out and had pizza with with some of the other friends and they said boy what a lesson that was how miserable they felt after eating the the white flour and the the cheese mm -hmm. and and all that but I mean I'll, I'll just it's acid reflux acne allergies Barrett's esophagus Bilary tract disease, bloating, boils, candida, celiac disease, col coliosis, 
chronic belching, chronic gas, colitis, colon cancer, constipation, Crohn's disease, cysts, dandruff, dermatitis, and it just goes on and on. I mean, your, your uh, kidney stones, irritable bowel, leaky gut system, malabsorption symptoms, uh, syndrome, peptic ulcer, pimples, proseocetis, psoriasis, rosacea, ulcer, ulcerative colitis uh, are all symptoms yeah. that yeah. could come from, or uh, do come. He, he says these are absolutely 100% uh, come from, from, you know, poor diet. And uh, he talks about, uh, this, is, this is Scott Olgren. Yeah, the, there was one sentence in that first page. I think it's right at the end of the first page that they actually repeated on the next page. Uh, uh, because they felt it was yeah. so important. Well, he, he says, if you take a quick look at this facing page, the list of symptoms alphabetically for easy viewing. If you live in the Western culture, chances are good that you have one of these symptoms. Chances are even better you know someone who suffers from one or more. But the highest odds, almost 100%, are that you have been taught the following. Number one, the symptoms have little to do with what you eat. Number two, the best way, the only way to get rid of these symptoms is through pharmaceutical drugs. And number three, mm -hmm. if there's no cure yet, it will be forthcoming and a few more billion dollars spent on research. Uh, we need more research money and the drug will be put into your bloodstream. Once that's accomplished, you will be cured. What you've been taught is not true. Every one of those symptoms, from rosacea to Crohn's to irritable bowel, is because of an internal condition of your current diet has created. More importantly, every single one of those skin and digestive allergies, allergic injuries, can be healed completely through little else than a cleaner choice of your food. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, this is where I think you meant, and mm -hmm. in case you glossed over that last sentence, let's restate it because it's central to the theme of this book. A change to a clean nutritional intake can eliminate all of these symptoms. Mm -hmm. um, so if we are to uh, uh, eat a clean diet, um, he, he says here too, and here's what I know for certain, the large majority of every digestive problem, skin condition, allergy, heart condition, blood, bacteria, fungus, yeast, internal terrain mess in a result of a metabolic toxic overload stemming directly from life-deadening and historically new food chain we and our children are currently consuming. And like he says, that, like in the history of humans, this is a very short period that we've been eating these things. And he said, it's not working. It, it isn't helping. Yeah, uh, I think over the gener as the generations go by on the standard American diet, I think each generation is sicker than the one ahead of them. I, I think. Uh, I think it just gets worse and worse. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, I mean like, like Dr. Dr. Uh, Margaret Mitchell said said to me once about organic food. She goes, she goes, if you eat all organic, she says, you're putting 20 new, 19 new carcinogenic compounds in your body every meal. I'm like, what do you mean? She goes, she goes, you can't get away from it. She goes, the air is polluted, the soil is polluted, the water we're using is polluted, the rain is polluted. She says, you can't get away from it. She goes, but if you don't eat all organic, 96 carcinogenic compounds in every, every meal you eat. So right, right. It at least lessens it. So. Right, right. Well, I hate to say it, but uh, we, we didn't cover as much as I thought we <laughs> I were going we to, but we've come to the end of another episode of Fresh Perspectives. Thank you for appearing again today. Thank you. And um, I'll see those of you in the viewing audience on the next episode. So, I mean... <laughs>